In this next part, we're going to be using um, something other than the discovery environment. We're going to be using Atmosphere, which is our cloud computing service. And uh, Josh Stein is going to take us through that as well as using Maker. Uh, this part is really fun because there's a lot of hands-on. Uh, and so let me ask the question uh, that's most interesting to Josh right now, <laughs> which is how many people here are pretty comfortable at the command line? OK, we've got a couple of people sprinkled out there. I hope you saw those hands because we're going to ask people to team up now uh, a little bit. So you can be working with the person that's next to you. And if, if, they're, if they're no good, you can switch and dump them and, and, and choose somebody else. But the key thing is that we need to work in teams. To, to use the atmosphere, right now, we are using uh, a system that's called Eucalyptus. You don't need to know about it. What matters is that for it to actually start, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and then we have to wait and see. And some of you might not have access to atmosphere. Uh, so Josh will talk about that. So rather than do that, uh, Christos and I are going to hand out these usernames and passwords. So when Josh asks you to log in to uh, atmosphere, you don't want to use your iPlan account. You're going to want to use this uh, password and username. So the, the, the usernames are all DNA subway and then some numbers. And then the password is all IPL at sign and whatever it comes after that. So you'll figure it out, the username and the password. Um, for those of you who are watching online, uh, if you want to, you can launch a, a maker image. And Josh will go into that. But you do need atmosphere access, which you need to get. So when you get your iPlan account, you don't automatically have it. You go back to user.iplan.org, uh, and there's a link for Atmosphere, and you can request access. So Christos and I are going to hand these out to roughly groups of two, uh, and you can work with them. If you're sitting by yourself, if you want to pair up with somebody or sit next to somebody, if you're totally afraid of the command line uh, and you just want to watch, you can, you can just sort of watch along. So I'm going to pass these out, and then I'll hand this over to Josh. All right, thank you. OK, so I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Joshua Stein, and I work here at Cold Spring Harbor uh, as a staff scientist. I work with uh, Doreen Ware. And I've been involved in uh, several uh, genome projects over the last couple of years including uh, maize, and I work on several uh, rice genome projects. Um, my uh, past history, uh, I'm a, actually a plant molecular biologist rather than a computer scientist. Uh, and uh, I spent some time uh, working uh, for Sirion Genomics, uh, which was a subsidiary of Monsanto. So that's how I got into genomics. Um, so the agenda for today is I'm going to uh, give a, a brief introduction uh, into the Atmosphere uh, cloud computing uh, system. And then uh, I'm going to switch over and talk about uh, annotation, uh, uh, annotation resources, what we want to build at, uh, at iPlant, and specifically talk about uh, the Maker P annotation method. And then uh, I'm going to uh, walk you through a demonstration of MakerP uh, as implemented uh, currently on Atmosphere. Now, all of the uh, slides and presentations are now loaded onto, onto this page. And so I recommend that you uh, uh, download them. Uh, particularly, uh, this tutorial will come in handy later because uh, for, for entering uh, command line uh, arguments, you know, rather than trying to type it, uh, you can just copy and paste it. So even if you're not familiar with the command line, you could uh, do that. Uh, so th that's, that's this tutorial here. I'm going to walk through uh, this set of slides here, which I've already downloaded. And then there's this set of slides. So you can have these. OK, so uh, this is an overview of atmosphere. Uh, so uh, we like to start with this, uh, this slide here. I'm, I'm not a computer expert. This overview uh, 
you know, I'm not going to go into uh, technical details about about uh, cloud computing. Uh, rather, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, my perspective uh, from a, a biologist. Uh, cloud computing, of course, is uh, quite a buzzword these days. Uh, in my experience, most of my, you know, I used to think of cloud computing, I would just sort of think of clouds out there, what is cloud computing? And then after getting an iPhone and my kids getting iPhones and Macintoshes, I realized that the uh, iCloud means that I sometimes get text messages directed at my 11-year-old son, which is odd. But um, so here, uh, cloud computing refers to the delivery of computing and storage capacity as a service to a heterogeneous community of end recipients. So wh what does this mean? I, I like to think about it as uh, uh, kind of like a, a library. So being able to take out a book and uh, rather than having to write the book yourself. So uh, if you've ever tried to install software, uh, it can be a real hassle. Sometimes there's a lot of dependencies. Uh, you don't have the correct modules. The system's not set up properly. Or you have to bug your system administrator. If you're actually a software developer, uh, you kind of have the same issues. You're trying to distribute software, uh, but people have to be able to download it and, and uh, configure it in order to have people use your software. With uh, cloud computing, you can uh, check out an instance, a virtual machine, and uh, it is already pre-configured with all of the software that you need. Uh, and, with, and with Atmosphere, you can actually make changes to, to this instance and uh, submit it back again. And that will get recorded as an image that, that you can then take out later or share with other people. So uh, th this has a lot of, um, of uh, applications. For example, uh, document documenting your work. Uh, you can uh, do a, a, an analysis. And rather than having to, I mean, record everything that you did, you have a complete record of it. And you can always uh, refer back to it. So this might actually come in handy in the future uh, uh, when publishing. OK, so for the, uh, at Atmosphere, we can take out uh, instances that are pre-configured. You can uh, specify uh, different memory requirements and processing power. Um, some of the advantages is that you can uh, access it with your iPlant uh, ID and password. And you can, from it, you can also easily access your data that's in the data store. And I'll show you some examples of that. OK. There are two main ways, once you take out uh, a, a, an atmosphere image, uh, there are two main ways of accessing. One is using the real VNC uh, viewer. And for people who intend to uh, work on the tutorial today, uh, I, I would like you to, if you don't already have this downloaded, uh, if you can take the time to do this over the next uh, half hour while I go through uh, my maker presentation, uh, uh, there's a link, I think, in uh, the handout uh, so that you can download it. We're, we're going to be using the real VNC here. You can also use uh, uh, a shell, but not for my particular uh, uh, tutorial. OK, so that's that. We will learn much more about Atmosphere when we, when we, go, through, when we go through the uh, tutorial. OK, now I'm going to discuss uh, genome annotation. What are gene annotations? Well, so of course, the whole purpose for sequencing a genome, the first question you have is, what are the genes? And so annotations are uh, descriptions of features in a genome. Uh, they can be uh, structural features, uh, such as exons and introns, UTRs. Uh, they can be uh, coding genes or non-coding genes. And 
going above that at, to a higher level, once you've identified uh, structural features, uh, there's also functional features, such as enzymatic activity, uh, expression. One of the key points in doing annotation is that you, you not only, because an, annotation is actually really messy, right? We, we all know that uh, it's not easy to define where the genes are. And even if you define where the genes are, it's not easy to define exactly what its structure is. Uh, so uh, it's very important uh, to have an evidence trail. That is, not only have you annotated uh, a particular region of the genome, uh, you, you have the underlying evidence and you know why it's annotated that way. So it's important to have an evidence trail. So of course this assists in quality control of your genome annotations. So uh, here are some examples of evidence that support structural annotation. Uh, I don't know how many of you have, uh, are aware of, there, there are several types of uh, uh, ab initio uh, annotation methods. These are, are pr programs that look for uh, patterns uh, in, in, in genomes. Uh, they're usually trained on, on a model and uh, without any uh, supporting evidence such as expression or anything, it can uh, predict uh, gene structures. Uh, then uh, there are evidence-based methods that uh, use uh, uh, expression data uh, traditionally, this has included ESTs or full-length cDNAs. Uh, nowadays, uh, we're getting more into uh, evidence that can come from RNA-seq, uh, high-throughput RNA-seq data, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, another approach is uh, protein homology. So if you already, uh, you, pe people typically will use uh, annotations from other sources uh, and, and look for homology as evidence. Once you've defined uh, gene models, uh, another level of annotation is secondary annotation, and I like to think about this as uh, annotating based on the protein sequence, and so there are a number of approaches, and some of these we, we have going right now at, at, are available uh, at, through the discovery environment, so one example of this is Interproscan. Uh, this is currently uh, in beta, but it is available now in, in the discovery environment. So you, uh, will, you can uh, enter uh, your protein sequences, and it'll predict uh, structures based on HMMs, things like, for example, protein kinase, known structures that have been uh, defined. And from there, uh, there are methods to assign uh, functions, such as go ontologies and pathways. So of course, uh, annotating plant genomes is uh, extremely challenging, even for small genomes. Uh, plant genomes uh, are even more challenging. They tend to be very big. Uh, for example, spruce is three times the size of, of the, uh, or six times the size of the human genome. Um, uh, highly repetitive, up to 90% repeats. Uh, there are many things that might look like genes, but are really fragments of genes. Old genes that have uh, uh, that have uh, lost their structural integrity, uh, pseudogenes, and yet it's extremely important to get it right because you're going to be using these annotations as a basis for your research. So whether it's uh, doing RNA seq and uh, trying to understand expression, uh, looking do, doing GWAS analysis, trying to identify genes that uh, are important for. Uh, for phenotypic traits or doing chip seek, what have you, if you don't have a good underlying uh, annotation, then you're going to get into trouble. One issue that we, that we know about is uh, contamination. So here's an example uh, uh, of, of an ARISA uh, uh, gene uh, in, in RefSeq, in NCBI. And it's actually uh, from vector contamination, and yet it's there, it's cataloged in RefSeq, and uh, this is uh, not the lone example. I've worked on uh, several plant genome projects over the last seven, seven years, and I've, I've seen uh, chicken contamination in plant genomes, I've seen human contamination in plant genomes, and of course I've seen lots, plenty of bacterial contamination as well. 
uh, there's a lot of, in existing annotation projects, there's a lot of annotation error. So one type of error are uh, split gene models. So uh, here's an example. Uh, this is using uh, the Grameen website, uh, using comparative genomics of both phylogenetic trees and whole genome, uh, whole genome alignments. Uh, this is uh, an example of a split gene model where a series of genes that are uh, lie adjacent to one another were called as being separate genes, but really uh, they should be annotated as the same gene. So with all of these problems, uh, it's important to try to collect and uh, as many different types of, use many different types of approaches and uh, evidence to put together uh, gene models. So in a typical uh, gene annotation pipeline, protein coding gene uh, pipeline, uh, one would do uh, contamination screening, uh, screening for uh, repeats or, or transposable elements. There are, once you've done that, there are ab initio gene predictors. Uh, and then you can apply your evidence, cDNA, EST, RNA-seq, uh, homology evidence from other, uh, from other organisms. And then uh, from this, uh, there are methods for doing evidence-based predictions. Once all of this evidence is put together, there are ways to combine the information to try to uh, come up with uh, the best model uh, for, for that uh, locus. And that involves evaluation and filtering, and then finally, in the end, manual curation uh, will be required. Most, most projects uh, don't have the resources to do all of these things. Uh, this is sort of a, uh, a step scale of, of uh, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, what's easy and cheap to do versus uh, what's, uh, but, but not as accurate, uh, and that, that would be doing, say, a single ab initio gene predictor, uh, and then uh, more work uh, using a variety of ab initio predictors, and then using a consensus to choose the best, uh, and then various methods to uh, uh, apply evidence. So as you go this way, you get increased accuracy, but it's also uh, going to cost more and be more time consuming. So Maker was developed by, and I, I don't think I, let me just go back to the original first slide. Okay, so uh, Maker P was uh, developed by uh, Carson Holt and uh, other members of the uh, Yandel Lab at the University of Utah. Uh, iPlant is now collaborating with them to help us to bring their software into uh, our systems and make them available through uh, the discovery environment and through uh, the atmosphere. Uh, some of the people that are working on this project, in addition to myself, are Matt Vaughn at uh, uh, Texas Advanced Computer Center, Dion Jiao, also at TAC. Uh, Zhen Wan Lu at uh, Cold Spring Harbor Lab, and Nirav Merchant, who's been working at uh, University of Arizona. So they wanted to build uh, a pipeline that uh, was easy to use, uh, didn't require a, a lot of expertise, could take advantage of all of these different methods. Uh, uh, the idea was that uh, you know, a graduate student could, could perform an annotation without a lot of training and that it would be uh, quick. So this is an overview of, of, the, of the pipeline. Uh, Maker uh, basically uh, combines a, a lot of different available software, aligners, uh, ab initio predictors, and pieces them together into a, a, an automated pipeline. So it identifies repeats, it does repeat masking, it does the alignments of ESTs and proteins to a genome, it produces the ab initio gene predictions, and it synthesizes these data into annotations and produces evidence-based quality values 
uh, for downstream annotation. And I'm going to, this is uh, what the pipeline looks like. Um, here it, it's, you can, it'll actually uh, run all of these analyses in an automated fashion. So you, you set up, uh, what you do as a user is to set up uh, your, you get your, all of your ducks in a row, all of your evidence data, and you specify these things, you spe point it at your genome, and it'll, it'll run through it. One of the nice things about it that really distinguishes Maker from uh, other annotation pipelines that are available is that uh, it comes out with a, a quality metric that uh, allows you to uh, distinguish good quality annotations from uh, poor quality annotations, and it uses something called the annotation edit distance. Basically, it asks how well does the final gene model uh, correspond to the underlying evidence, and it looks at uh, specificity and sensitivity and creates this distance uh, matrix, and the lower the, the AED, the distance, the better the uh, annotation is. And so at the end of the day, you, if you come out with 40,000 uh, annotations, you have this, uh, this metric that you can use to try to distinguish and uh, filter uh, your final set. And so this just shows a plot here. This uh, brown line here represents a, a well-annotated well set of genes. Uh, in between is a reasonably well annotated, and then down here, uh, poorly annotated. So they also built into, in, in the newest version of MakerP, uh, MPI support. So MPI is a, it stands for message passing interface, and it enables uh, parallel processing of, of Maker across uh, many different uh, cores. So it can be used in a supercomputer environment, such as at, at uh, TAC. Uh, and because of this, it's able to divide the jobs up uh, and, and spread it out amongst uh, hundreds or thousands of, of different cores and get the job done very quickly. So whereas a genome annotation project uh, used to take uh, months to complete uh, the latest version of Maker P can complete a genome in about two hours. Uh, it'll, I mean, you know, it, you may not be done, you may not be satisfied with the result, but at least you have the result in two hours, and if, if there's something you don't like about it, you can change parameters and run it again. So this just uh, goes through some of the concepts of what uh, Maker is doing. This is, an, uh, this is using uh, Apollo, which is a, uh, a visualizer for gene annotations, and it's actually very, a very useful tool uh, downstream uh, once you're ready to evaluate annotations and do manual curation. Here, uh, uh, this is showing uh, how the uh, pipeline proceeds. So first, it identifies repeats. So it runs repeat masker. Of course, you need uh, a library for that, uh, plant, uh, uh, a plant, a repeat library that, that is appropriate for, for your organism. Um, if you don't have that, of course, you could use some other tools that are available at the discovery environment, uh, such as Talimer, uh, uh, which, does, uh, which can define uh, repetitive elements uh, based on KMERS mathematically and actually do masking that way. It also runs Repeat Runner, which uh, uses uh, a protein uh, repeat library. Here it does uh, ab initio predictions, and it's currently able to work with uh, four different ab initio predictors. Uh, SNAP and uh, Augustus uh, work fairly well for plants. They, they need to be uh, trained uh, for your particular organism, but there are HMMs available for a variety of plants already available, and they uh, might work okay for your organism, uh, and you have the opportunity to do uh, training uh, with them. So in particular, SNAP 
was uh, designed, uh, came out of the lab of Ian Korf, and uh, you can use uh, SNAP to uh, optimize and train uh, your own HMM uh, to improve the ab initio predictor. Uh, it also works with F genes H. F genes H is an excellent ab initio gene predictor. Uh, however, it's proprietary, so you have to purchase a uh, license in order to use it. Uh, and because of that, iPlant uh, does not offer F genes H, but we do offer uh, SNAP and Augustus currently. So, and these can be run uh, internally or externally. So the reason I say that is, so if it's run internally, then the pipeline actually runs uh, SNAP, and it can actually feed SNAP um, uh, clues or hints uh, based on alignment data to uh, improve the uh, prediction. Um, or it can take uh, data exogenously if you've run uh, an ab initio predictor, some other type of ab initio predictor, and you can provide it as a GFF file, and it'll incorporate that into uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, gene calling. And so this is particularly uh, important if you want to use F genes H and your institution or your lab has a license for F genes H, you can still use it, you can run it on your genome uh, and produce a, a GFF uh, output file and feed that to Maker, and Maker will incorporate uh, those data. Okay, then it's going to do alignments. Uh, it'll use BLAST X uh, to align uh, proteins. It'll use BLAST N and, and uh, also BLAST X to align ESTs. Uh, it'll find uh, putative uh, expressed regions and uh, uh, and then it takes those alignments and it repeats the alignment using a software called Exonerate. Exonerate is able to do the alignment but is aware of, of uh, intron exon boundaries. And so it produces uh, polished uh, alignments. And so this is used as a basis to um, do a better job in uh, defining the intron exon boundaries where BLAST, BLAST is not capable of doing that. It uses this information, it, it provides hints to uh, SNAP, it can provide hints to F genes H if it's running F genes H. It can also provide hints to Augustus. So uh, that information then is used by those ab initio predictors to uh, improve its prediction. Okay, finally uh, it, uh, chooses uh, gene models on the basis of all these evidence. It produces the AED score, and you can also, and you can get uh, summary data uh, on that. Okay, so Maker P at iPlant. Currently, uh, we're working with the latest uh, stable version, uh, 2.28. It's now installed at TAC Lone Star. This actually took quite a bit of, of work to do. We worked directly with Carson Holt, uh, who had to, do a lot of changes on the software to optimize it for the architecture of TAC Lone Star. So TAC Lone Star is a supercomputer. It's got over 22,000 uh, CPUs. Uh, it's MPI uh, enabled, so all, all of it can dis distribute thousands of, of, of different jobs. Uh, and in our testing, uh, we've been able to uh, using the same data sets that we'll, we'll go through uh, in our tutorial, we can complete the uh, rice genome in uh, about two hours using 1,152 uh, cores. And the way we do, de do that is to distribute each of the 12 chromosomes over 96 uh, CPUs. Uh, I've also tested it with various other uh, assemblies. So, you know, rice is, is an example of a very nice uh, assembly. It's, it's very mature. It's got, you know, 12 uh, pseudomolecules. Um, uh, most, I, most annotation projects going forward are not going to have that level of completeness in their assembly. Uh, instead, they're, they're going to have 
thousands or tens, tens of thousands of contigs uh, coming out of an all paths assembly or some other type of assembly. So I've tested it on uh, Agelops Tauschi, which is a diploid uh, wheat uh, genome, and uh, using uh, uh, also EST and cDNA evidence. Uh, and it was able to complete in about eight hours using, this, using also 1,152 cores. So, um, so here, I mean, the, the key feature of this is that you can start this, you can set it up, you can get data out, you can do evaluation on it, you can uh, decide uh, uh, whether uh, you're satisfied or not, uh, you can experiment with uh, different parameters, and uh, over time improve your annotation. So the status with um, the TAC Lone Star installation, is, it's there. Um, it's currently being uh, made, so in order to, uh, it, it can be accessed through the discovery environment, or that's what we're working towards. Uh, so uh, and we, we're hoping to have that complete in the next month or so. Um, so that people uh, logging into the discovery environment can run MakerP and it'll actually be running on Lone Star. In the meantime, we have an atmosphere uh, version of this. Uh, it's the same software, it's also MPI enabled. Um, the difference here is that uh, you only have, when you get an, an instance out, uh, you have a maximum size of 16 CPUs, which maybe isn't so bad. I don't know yet how workable th that is, I haven't, uh, this is fairly new, so I haven't um, uh, evaluated it yet. Uh, but you know, with 16 CPUs, you could imagine um, if you, using the rice example, uh, you could imagine uh, running uh, a single chromosome per instance, and you know, maybe it'll take several days. But that's uh, that's that's not bad. At a minimum, the Atmosphere version will be uh, useful for uh, doing um, prototyping. So you, you, know, you could take out an instance, you can learn about how it works, you can do all of your prototyping, uh, get things uh, uh, working well there, and then when you're ready, you can uh, launch the job at, at TAC. So, so what we're going to do today is actually, uh, I'm going to introduce you to the Atmosphere version of this, and we're going to run through an example. This is using the command line. Uh, once it's available in the discovery environment, theoretically, uh, you won't, people who don't want to use the command line don't have to, and uh, 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 they'll be able to uh, uh, use it strictly using a graphical user interface. So uh, this fits into an an overall uh, uh, plan that iPlant has that uh, involves uh, really enabling uh, single researchers, researchers to do their own genome project. So genome projects were usually, you know, in the past have been the, uh, the domain of, you know, large uh, genome centers, large uh, multi-institutional projects, many researchers, millions of dollars spent, you know, but the technology, the cost of sequences, sequencing is coming down uh, so that people can, you know, study their own organism. They can create their own genome project. They can, uh, in, in this uh, scheme, uh, one would uh, sequence the genome. They could also get uh, transcriptome assemblies. The using uh, iPlant resources, they could uh, do their genome assembly to create their uh, to create their reference genome, the, the uh, transcriptome data from RNA seq uh, can be assembled. Currently, we have uh, Trinity uh, Velvet uh, as uh, de novo transcriptome assembly methods. Uh, we also have reference guided assembly methods, Top Hat and Cufflinks available. And the key to this is that the transcriptome uh, evidence can actually be used by Maker, and it can be used uh, fairly directly. Maker comes with conversion tools that allows one to use the output of Top Hat and Cufflinks uh, to convert that into 
uh, a file format that is uh, readable by, by Maker. And so we have these conversion tools that are already there in the discovery environment. So that's top hat to GFF and cufflinks to GFF. So if you have RNA-seq data and you've run these analyses, uh, 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 you, can, you can do those conversions. The uh, Trinity assembly or Velvet Oasis assembly can be used directly, just as you would use uh, EST evidence. Um, so with this, the, the idea is that then a, a, a user could go to uh, Maker for their annotations. Uh, th this, is, this shows the software that, that Maker is using right now, Augustus, Snap, Exonerate, Blast, and Repeat Masker. Um, if you don't uh, have a good repeat library, uh, you could use other tools in the discovery environment, such as the Talimer package, which I mentioned. Um, you could, uh, or you can, you know, try to, you know, go out to the community and find uh, uh, repeat, li you know, repeat libraries from other genome projects. That would, that's the other other route. Um, the SNAP, uh, as I said. Uh, it was designed not only to do ab initio prediction, but also to be trainable. And it was designed specifically so that it would be easily trainable. So there are methods for that. Uh, that can be done using the atmosphere image currently uh, on the command line. Uh, we want to, while SNAP is also available as a standalone tool in the discovery environment, but the ability to do the, the training is not there yet. So that's something that we have in, in as, as a goal. Once, the, um, once you get uh, maker data out, there are conversion tools that uh, enable uh, visualization. One of those is maker to J, J browse, and that's already integrated into the, the discovery environment. Uh, another conversion tool is maker to ZFF, so that's actually a conversion tool that uh, would be used for uh, SNAP training. Uh, so, as I mentioned, SNAP training, that's uh, something that's in progress that we're trying to put into the discovery environment now. Uh, we want to get visualization uh, up and available so that people, once they have their data, they can distribute that information. Uh, so, in the next year or two, uh, we'll be working towards uh, uh, allowing people or enabling people to set up uh, 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 a, a visualization web service that runs JBrowse and also Web, web Apollo, which will help uh, for doing uh, manual curation. For uh, post annotation, I mentioned uh, Interpro Scan and Interpro to Go. Those are currently available in the discovery environment. Um, Interpro Scan uh, is running on TAC, and I've uh, done quite a bit of work with it. Uh, I've annotated uh, 12 uh, uh, species of, of rice uh, associated with a project that I'm working with, and it can, it can run through about 40,000 uh, uh, protein sequences in about five hours. So that's a really, really ter uh, terrific uh, resource. We're also working on uh, non-coding uh, RNA annotation. So uh, my colleague at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Zhen Wan Lu is working on um, MirDeep2, integrating that into Atmosphere. So that takes advantage of uh, small RNA uh, libraries uh, with the goal of identifying uh, microRNA genes. Maker, as well, is there's future development with Maker. Newer versions of Maker uh, are, are, so current development in Maker will also add uh, the ability to annotate uh, non-coding genes. So, and we'll employ um, tools like in Infernal and other tools to do uh, non-coding RNA gene prediction. Uh, also, new developments with, with Maker will be uh, methods to identify pseudogenes. So these are all things that uh, we're kind of looking forward to uh, at iPlant. And then uh, kind of a dream of mine is, uh, is to, I think the, the real power of iPlant will be not just its tools, but also 
the data that iPlant generates. And if you think about it, if someone uh, does, uh, develops a new HMM to, that is able to uh, annotate uh, a new genome, um, uh, if that could be made available to the community, uh, you can th iPlant could become you know, a resource for, for annotation. People could go and there would be you know, HMMs available, potentially repeat libraries available. So uh, I think uh, iPlant could become uh, a very strong resource, uh, not only just for tools, but also in, in uh, developing a body of, of data that reaches a critical mass that's you know, really, really useful to uh, the community. Okay, so uh, I am going to, we, we are going to now do the, a, a tutorial on atmosphere. And before we uh, transition to atmosphere, uh, we have a couple of questions Josh. Oh, yes. So there are questions from the audience. Uh, so far, there are a couple online. I'll give you guys. Uh, first crack before we go to questions from online. Okay. So one question uh, online, uh, can you please explain what a repeat library is? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, a repeat library is a, is a collection of sequences that uh, someone has uh, curated that represents uh, highly, represented, highly represented sequences in a uh, genome, and generally uh, they are transposable elements. And so with um, any traditional uh, uh, genome project, uh, for example, the, the maze genome project, which I was involved with, um, uh, there'll, there'll be a specific research team that is interested in transposable elements, and they'll go in and annotate the transposable elements and create uh, a library of, of transposable elements. And I can tell you, uh, the well, one thing that was interesting about the maze project was that uh, it actually went in two phases. The early phase was uh, uh, was to was more of a, a study phase to see uh, to, to look at the um, uh, feasibility, and so a hundred backs uh, were sequenced, and a, a group uh, in Germany, the uh, the MIPS uh, group, annotated the transposable elements there and created a repeat library. And when the final gene, just on the basis of 100 backs, when the final genome project was completed, which used uh, 16,000 uh, backs, that repeat library was able to identify, was able to uh, align to 70% of the maze genome. And the research group that subsequently analyzed it uh, uh, identified additional repeats, and, and that brought the value up to about 80%. So uh, even with a small amount of sequence from, depending on the complexity, so maize has a lot of very recently evolved, or uh, tr there was a very recent uh, burst in, in transposable elements, and so they weren't that diverged. Even with a, a small fraction of the genome, it's possible to identify re repetitive elements and transposable elements, create a repeat library that could be applied to your entire genome later on. And one last question uh, from Twitter, just a very general one. What are the computer requirements needed to run iPlant? Pretty Needed general. to run iPlant? Yeah. What is their computer requirements? Well. Um, Right now, uh, there are uh, several infrastructures. Uh, one is at uh, the Texas Advanced uh, Computing Center, and so that includes, and these are supercomputers, very large facilities, uh, so that includes uh, t uh, TAC Corral and uh, TAC Lone Star, and then uh, the, um, at University of Arizona, they have also a large cluster that runs some, uh, uh, it's a condor cluster, and I, I don't know much about uh, uh, the size of that. Yeah, so, but um, that's what you can access. And in general, uh, you just need your laptop to access uh, everything online. So for you locally, there's not any special uh, requirements in general. 
That's right. Okay, those are the questions from online. Okay. So that's, that's actually the beauty of, of Atmosphere is that uh, you, you can have some junky laptop and run uh, a really snazzy uh, virtual, uh, virtual machine and uh, uh, that does, that's a very powerful computer. So, um, okay. So I am going to work with this Word document here. You should have a printout of that. And also, if you want, you can uh, download it onto your computer so that if you're, uh, to make your life easy, you can copy and paste uh, things into the command line if you want. So, so in the purpose of this tutorial, I'm going to take you through uh, launching uh, an atmosphere image uh, that runs Maker P. Uh, we're going to set up. Uh, we're going to set up Make Maker P for a run, and then actually run Maker P. Uh, we're going to once we get the output, uh, you'll learn how to copy that output uh, back to your data store. So when you when you check out a virtual image, you you create data on it, but once once that once you close that virtual image or terminate it, all of the data that you've created goes away. And so if you want to keep your data, uh, you're going to have to copy it back to your data store. And then finally, uh, Atmosphere has some abilities to do uh, uh, visualization using the integrated genome viewer. And I'll show you how to do that with the maker output. So if you haven't already, um, we're going to be using the VNC viewer. Uh, that's, there's a link to it on, on this document you can uh, download. Um, and to start the tutorial, we're going to go to Atmosphere. So as you're doing this, uh, please take advantage of being Christos. If you want to get stuck, work with your partners, but we're also here to help you. So this is the entry page. Uh, you're going to need to log in. I'm going to use, whoops. I'm going to start over here. OK, so I'm actually going to start here at the front page. Does anybody? You need to go to user just to. Uh, I went from the front page. Try going from user so you can. When you click, yeah, go from user. Somehow you're logged in or not logged in the right way. User done yeah. iPad. Uh, you log in. See, you're logged in as Michael somehow. There's so many browsers. Oh, uh, okay. I just log out. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, we have 20 instances available. So Yeah, if you, if you both interact with the same image, then you'll be working on it at the same time. It's possible to do, but. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm, I'm at this point right now, um, so uh, when everybody gets to this point, let me know. You guys are, are there? Okay. So all of you should, be, should see at least one of these in instances already available. Let me just uh, show you a little bit more about this. So in this interface, um, if you wanted to launch a new, so we've already pre-launched all of these instances for you because it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to launch, to launch an, an atmosphere image. Um, but if you're coming into the, if you were coming into this uh, as a as a user, uh, not in a not in a workshop, uh, you would click on this button here, and this would bring up a menu of available images, and you can search for them. So I would enter Maker P, and there's two: one that I did some testing with, and then this other one here, which is MPI enabled. And you would click on that and launch the image using this button. That would result, that would make an icon pop up over here, except rather than it being green, it would be brown, and it would be launching. And eventually, you would get an email in about 10 to 15 minutes saying it was ready. Once it's ready, it would turn green like this. So if you guys are ready, um, what you want to do is go here and copy this IP address. So just copy that address and then go to your VNC viewer and paste that IP address into the VNC viewer window. And as you get stuck with any of these, besides the fact that you're working in a team, so one person at least hopefully hears the directions, just let us know. Uh, so as Josh just said, you right now, and I'll turn on my mic too so that people online hear my voice. So when you log in, again, on the left-hand side, you are going to see instance running. And this is for everybody with a demo account. When you do this for the very first time and you go through, and we can sort of go through that, and you choose an image that uh, is configured for what you want to do, you press launch, and it takes a few minutes. But now everyone using a demo account should see that green icon that it's running. And underneath it, uh, is the IP address. You're going to paste that into the VNC viewer, and then you need to type in, as Josh is going to show yes. you, colon one to start connecting. Colon one. And then you leave everything. It says let VNC server ch uh, choose. You go ahead and connect. Press connect. And you're going to get this message here. It says no signature has been stored for this VNC viewer, so its identity cannot be verified. You want to select no. Yes. You want to select, want to select yes. yes. Do you wish to accept the signature and continue connecting? Yes. OK. And here is the other trick. So right now, it's going to ask you to log in. You need to use that same username and password to log in. So whatever we've given you for that demo account, it's the same username and password. So DNA subway number and then password. Yes. Oh, yes. You need, I so, can, I can, okay. I'll. Okay, you need the software? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll show you. So sometimes there's a, a bit of a lag. Okay, so it took, uh, there was uh, a latency of about 20 seconds before this other window popped up and uh, you have to type in your password again. Okay, raise your hand when you've gotten to this point. Okay. All right, so I'll, OK, good. I'll proceed. OK, so this is a virtual desktop. So you would work with this just like you would work with uh, any other computer. So it's got various uh, drop-down menus here, uh, accessories. Uh, later, uh, you'll, 
you might want to use a text editor. That's later in the in this session. Uh, there's a bunch of things that we've placed on the desktop for convenience. Um, all of the uh, data for this is pre-staged, pre and it's located in this folder here. Feel free to open it. So this has uh, all of the evidence, the genome file, and the evidence files that we're going to use. And plus, uh, because once you launch Maker, it'll take about 30 minutes to complete. Uh, just like uh, Mike used this trick of putting something in the oven and taking something out of the other oven, I'm going to do the same thing. I have example output in this folder here called example output. Now the um, genome uh, that we're using is just a pet genome. What I did was I took the rice genome, I took the first 100 KB of each uh, chromosome and created a, a, a little uh, uh, fake uh, chromosome for each of those. So there's 12 chromosomes, each 100 KB, and that's what we're going to annotate. However, all of the um, uh, evidence files that we're going to use uh, are, are real full sets of, of, of evidence files. So for that, um, I have uh, mRNA FASTA sequences. So these are sequences that were uh, downloaded from NCBI representing uh, all of the ERISA mRNAs and cDNAs that are available. I think it was, I don't know, 40, 40 or 50,000. Um, I have uh, protein evidence, and these are annotated proteins uh, from the current, the most up-to-date uh, annotation of rice, and there are actually two. There's MSU annotations and IRGSP, and what I've done there is I created a non-redundant set of those, and so that's what we're using as protein evidence. And then for uh, repeat masking, I have uh, a set of, of plant repeats uh, uh, that I uh, obtained from a colleague. Okay, but we're not going to interact uh, with the data this, uh, this way. We're actually going to use the uh, terminal. And so to access the terminal, there's a, a, a link on the desktop here. And just double click that, and that will bring you to this terminal here. So um, in order to, what we're going to first do is just uh, orient ourselves to what's here. And so um, we're going to, if we type list, we'll see what's available. Right now, we're in our home directory. If you type uh, PWD, it'll, it'll, it'll say what directory you're in. So you're in your home directory. Um, if you type list, you'll see that there's a directory called desk, desktop and something that's called start.jnlp. I don't know what that is. We can examine the context, contents of desktop by doing list desktop. And there's uh, a, fi uh, a folder here called uh, maker p example data. And so that's the same folder that we were just looking at uh, over here when we were looking at it in this graphical form. So the same stuff that's in this folder when we view it graphically uh, is what's in when we uh, look at it on the command line. So you can do list. Uh, desktop maker p and uh, I'm doing a trick where I do list and I start typing desktop and I auto complete by pressing the tab key so if you look at this uh, this shows uh, the evidence data that I sh that I just uh, talked to you about um, you can examine that if you want to by typing less oops uh, let's look at the um, uh, look at the mRNA. So this is this is a FASTA file, FASTA format. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a sequence format, and it has uh, this greater than sign and an ID. So that's that's the form of of all of our evidence data that we're going to be using. And then um, I also have uh, some uh, configuration files, which we'll talk about later. And then also uh, there's uh, example output, which we'll look at later as well. Now the, um, the, 
the maker executables, I'll, I'll show you where those are. Those are actually, uh, there's two locations. Uh, maker itself can be found in uh, slash opt, maker bin. And you can see there's a number of, of tools in here. The, the, the actual maker executable is called maker. And then there are all of these uh, auxiliary scripts, some of which I talked about in my presentation. So, for example, the, um, uh, the uh, top hat to GFF3, for example. All of these scripts are, are available in here, which are useful for pre-processing your uh, evidence data and also for doing some post-processing. The other... Uh, the other place where there are executables are in slash opt maker exe. And this is where all of the, uh, the, de the uh, dependent uh, executables are. So repeat maskers here, uh, Augustus, Blast, Exonerate, and Snap. Uh, MPI-CH2 is uh, what enables a maker to work in MPI mode. We're not going to be... Uh, using MPI mode uh, for this tutorial. OK. So the first step, are, are all of you following me? OK. So we're going to set up a run. And let's see, what did I say? I'm going to get my, my hand out. OK, we're going to create a directory. Oh, OK. So actually, uh, this particular atmosphere image uh, is a little bit defective. There are some environmental variables that, that make it easier to, to use. Um, probably, for the purpose of this tutorial, the only one that's really important is the first one on this list. Um, I'm currently at step three. Uh, so. It's not essential that you do this, but it makes, uh, makes uh, work a little bit easier. So we're, gonna, uh, do, we're, we're going to set an environmental variable that tells, uh, uh, that tells our environment where Maker lives. And so we're going to do export uh, path equals opt maker bin dollar sign P-A-T-H, all caps. And we're going to hit return. And now uh, we should be able to just uh, type uh, maker, and uh, it'll execute. If we hadn't done that, then you would have had to have typed the entire path to maker in order to run maker. So let's see if this worked. Um, well, I don't want to skip ahead. We'll see if it worked uh, in step five. Let's uh, continue with step four. We're going to set up a maker run. So we're going to create a, a working directory. And we're going to call that uh, maker underscore run. So, so the command for make a directory is uh, mkdir. And so now, when you, after executing that, when you type list, you should have a, a new directory called maker run. And now we're going to move into maker run by cd. We type cd maker run. And now you're in uh, the maker run directory. And there's nothing in there. OK, the next step, we're now on step five. We're going to copy our evidence data into, oh, actually, no, we're going to. We're going, to create, oh, we're going to create another directory in here called test data. So type make dir test data. And it's extremely important uh, for this tutorial uh, that, that you correctly designate this directory test underscore data as written. Because uh, 
maker otherwise won't be able to know where to find the files if it's not, if it's not that. OK, so we should have now a directory. If you type list, we should have a directory called test data. If you type pwd, we're, we're in this directory, your home directory, maker run. Now we're going to copy the uh, evidence data into test data. We're going to type copy, tilde, desktop, maker, and if you do asterisk.fasta, that'll copy all of the FASTA files. And you designate the destination as being test data and hit return. And now when you look in test data, you should find your evidence files. So type list test data, and you should have the, uh, the four files there. Yes, it is. Yeah, so, so um, attention to detail is very, very important when you're working in the command line. Uh, Everything is, is interpreted, so you, if you have a space where there shouldn't be a space, or if you don't have a space where there should be a space, uh, that's a problem. And, so and it's case I sensitive. I just want to emphasize, most people are doing OK. If you just get totally lost in copying, pasting, and taps and spaces are just losing you, uh, it may be more valuable to watch the video uh, or to go through this at your own pace. So don't feel pressured uh, that you have to get every single thing right. But for those following along, OK, so now we're going to try to run Maker. And we're not going to actually have it do any annotation. We're just going to run Maker with the help uh, flag. And that's going to tell us what the usage uh, is and, and the various uh, options are uh, for ar different arguments when running Maker. So we're going to type Maker-help. And if your configuration, if your, if you set your environment variable correctly, uh, you should be seeing this right now. Oops. Okay, so here uh, it, it it gives you the version of Maker. It tells you the basic usage. So you're supposed to do Maker, and then you're supposed to provide it with these files here. It gives a description of Maker, and then it shows uh, various uh, options. And um, uh, you're free to uh, study this in, in greater detail uh, later for the, for the purpose of this tutorial. Uh, the, the only option that we, we need to know right now is the dash CTL. And so I'm, I'm going to move now to step seven. OK. So in step seven, we're going to run Maker, and it is going to create three control files. So what are these files? These are basically configuration files that tell uh, Maker, uh, th that provide Maker with uh, different kinds of information. So one file is the Maker Ops file. And this is a file that gives, that we will use to tell Maker where all of the input data are located. So that includes the genome data, plus plus the evidence data, the mRNA data, the protein data, the repeat data. Um, so that is something that we will uh, need to modify, generally. It also produces a file called maker underscore exe dot ctl. This is the maker exe control file. And this tells Maker where all of the underlying uh, uh, dependencies are, where all the underlying executables are, where Blast is located, where uh, Repeat Masker is located, where Exonerate is located. Um, the nice thing is that uh, if Maker is properly configured, it'll automatically generate that file, and all of the information is there for you, and you don't have to change it. So we won't have to change that. The last file it generates is the maker bopt file, bopt.ctl file. And this sets uh, parameters, various parameters for filtering uh, 
uh, blast results and, exoner and exonerate results. And um, when it's generated automatically, it actually generates uh, reasonable uh, def default values uh, for all of these. And uh, unless uh, you're, you're at the stage where uh, you want to try to fiddle with these uh, values to do uh, parameter optimization uh, as a baseline, uh, what it gives you automatically is a good place to start. So we, we won't need to modify that. Now, um, the tutorial runs through how you would uh, edit the, so we would want to edit the maker uh, opt file. And you can see what, oh, OK. So actually, let's run that command now. So we're at step, we're at step seven. So we're going to create these control files. So type uh, maker-ctl. OK, now when you type list, you should see these new files. And you can view them uh, with the less command. So let's, let's look at the, have you guys uh, gotten to that point? OK. OK, have we, have we gotten uh, these three files generated? OK. So uh, if you type uh, less maker underscore ops, you can view uh, what, what this file looks like. So this is where we're going to designate uh, the location of our genome file and the location of our evidence file here. And f there are various uh, text editors that are available. One that I would recommend. And I'm just going to show you this. I think what we're going to do, how do I get this? All right. All right. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, no, what you should be able to do, unless you, uh, yeah. I have this folder that's sort of stuck here. Um, but in the command line, OK. Nah. So theoretically, if you want to, you could do, uh, you can uh, edit this file by doing um, get it. And this will create this uh, graphical user interface. And, and then you would go and you would type the path to your information. So, this would be test data, test genome, dot fast A, et cetera. We don't have time for this, though. So I have staged, I have staged a, an, a maker ops file that's pre-populated with this information that we can use. And so what we're going to do. Uh, is we're going to get rid of our existing maker ops file and we're going to copy the, the staged file over. So that's, we're going to do copy tilde desktop maker p example data maker ops dot and we're going to copy it to this location. Now we're going to have a new maker ops file and all of this information is now populated properly. So let's just uh, run through this here. So this is where you're going to specify uh, all of the information that you want Maker to, to look at. So in the top line, 
uh, genome. We've given it the, the genome FASTA file. And you'll note that I've used uh, a relative path. So that's based on, on where, where your working directory is. So it's just dot test data test genome dot FASTA. We don't have any, the, the next uh, set of lines pertain to um, uh, something that's uh, not in the scope of this tutorial. It's re-annotating uh, using make-derived GFF files. We're going to ignore that. We're going to move down to EST evidence. And here, uh, th the location of our mRNA file is located here, so EST. Now, it's important when, if you're doing this on your own, there should not be any spaces between the, the uh, equal sign and the path to your file. If you had additional data, let's say we had, um, let's say you were annotating tomato and you had uh, ESTs from eggplant or something, that would qualify maybe as a closely related species. It's in the Solanacea. Um, so you could put, you could have a collection of eggplant ESTs and you would enter that uh, in alt EST. So that's ESTs derived from uh, a, cl a closely related species. If you had data uh, from ESTs that are aligned to your genome, let's say you did um, uh, a, a cufflinks uh, reference guided assembly and you had that cufflinks uh, data and you ran the, the maker tool cufflinks to GFF, that would, which would put that data into a GFF format, you could then specify that file here under EST underscore uh, GFF. For protein data, uh, similarly, uh, we're specifying our protein file here. But there's also, in the event that we had uh, homology data already from an alignment that we already did, uh, and that was in the form of a GFF file, uh, then um, we could specify it here. Do you guys know what a GFF file is? OK. So a GFF. GFF stands for a general feature format, and it's a way of specifying, uh, describing features on a genome. So it basically gives the coordinates of, uh, it, it'll give the sequence name, chromosome one, and then the star coordinate, and, and an end coordinate, and then describe something about those coordinates, whether it's a, an exon or some other type of feature. In this case, it would be an alignment feature. Okay, so under repeat masking, here we're, we're providing it with under RMLIB. So this is the re repeat masker lib. So this is just the FASTA sequence containing repetitive elements in FASTA format. Um, if uh, we were this this line up here, model organism. This this is in a situation if 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 Maker was loaded with uh, the data, the rep base, or if, if repeat masker was loaded with the rep base uh, data, database, we could, we could specify an organism that way. Rep base, however, is, um, uh, has a, uh, is, is, is licensed, so uh, we, we, iPlant is unable to, to provide, provide that. Um, so there are, there are uh, many other features, and the nice thing about this is that you can see uh, that uh, there's fairly good documentation about what these different options mean and what they do. Under gene prediction, we're going to be using SNAP. So here we've specified the uh, complete path to the HMM. SNAP happens to be packaged with an HMM that's good for, for Ariza sativa. So uh, we're specifying that. Uh, there's also space here if, if we, we, gene, gene mark is not something that's supported in this atmosphere image, but the option is there nevertheless. Augustus is, so if we wanted to run Augustus, we could. Uh, and so you would specify uh, the species. So Augustus 2 also uh, has uh, parameter files uh, that tell it which, 
which model to use when doing gene prediction, and, and you would specify it there. So we're not, we're not using any of these options. EST to genome, yes? Yes. It's a hidden Markov model, uh, and it is a way of, uh, it, it's a mathematical model that uh, finds patterns uh, within data. And so it's been applied uh, to find patterns within exon intron structure. And that, that pattern is uh, specific to uh, different genomes because of the, the size of introns, the GC content, uh, uh, types of uh, splice uh, sites that it has. That's right. So to actually see what is available, uh, you can do, uh, you can look uh, under the hood of SNAP, and if you list uh, this path, list uh, back, uh, slash opt maker exe SNAP HMM and hit return, it'll show you the list of all the HMMs that it came packaged with. So if you're working uh, on uh, uh, another grass, uh, let's say, um, uh, fes you know, tall fescue or something, they're not going to, there isn't tall fescue here, but there is a rhizo sativa, it's a related genome, maybe it, it would be suitable, that would be a place to start anyway. Uh, you would want to think about uh, eventually creating uh, an, an optimized model for tall fescue, uh, but in the meantime, to get started, you could use uh, the rice HMM model. It also has uh, the Arabidopsis HMO model, AT.HMM, and a variety if you work on insects or, or other organisms, um, uh, fly, worm, uh, there's other HMM models available. Similarly, uh, Augustus has a number, um, let's see, okay. Uh, so for Augustus, uh, you can, um, you can do Augustus, uh, no, slash opt, oops. Oh, exe. Ah. Well, I'll, um, I don't recall ex exactly how to do to search for Augustus, but there's a command. It's not set up properly, but you could do um, Augustus, and then there's a, an option that's, uh, that's like dash dash species equals help, and then it'll give you a list of, of uh, models that are available for Augustus. For this tutorial, uh, uh, I can tell you that Augustus has maize. It does not have rice. It has Arabidopsis. Um, it might have one or two other plants. Okay. Okay, so getting back to our maker opt file, we're just running through this. Um, here, uh, uh, again, we, we don't have F genes H, but if we did have F genes H, uh, you could specify what model uh, here. However, um, if you ran F genes H, say at your own institution and converted that information into a GFF file, you could bring that in and specify it uh, using the pred underscore GFF, and Maker would make use of, of your F genes H models in its prediction. Okay, uh, model GFF, uh, these are, um, 
this is uh, annotation pass-through. So if there are annotations that you already like and you want to keep and you want to sort of pull that in with whatever Maker says, you can include those as well and it'll automatically uh, include those in its final output. Now two, two parameters that I think are important are EST to genome and protein to genome. So here, these will uh, infer gene predictions uh, directly from the exonerate uh, uh, alignments. So according to uh, my experience um, and recommendations from Carson Holt, uh, if you do not have uh, a, a, a good gene predictor, uh, such as a SNAP HMM, a good model, uh, you could specify, you, you could turn these options on by, you, you would change the zero into one. And these would give you some preliminary models um, uh, based on, on the exonerate alignments. And those could then be used as a basis for doing training of SNAP, for example. Uh, but uh, if you do have a good uh, ab initio predictor, uh, then it's, I mean, you can certainly experiment with it. You might want to keep those off. Uh, turning them on can lead to uh, the possibility of, of spurious uh, gene calls. So you might have, I, I know that when I used it, I ended up with a lot more gene calls than when I don't. So there's prob probably false positives there. Okay, moving down. Um, did we do, okay. That's mostly it. There's other uh, behavior options here. Um, CPUs, uh, uh, you can adjust. Uh, this, will affect, uh, this will affect how BLAST uh, distributes this job, these jobs. Um, so for example, if you have a, uh, in our example, for, we're, we're using a virtual machine that has two processors, so we might want to change that to two and it might work more efficiently. I haven't uh, tried it yet, but that would allow, that would enable uh, BLAST uh, to uh, work with two processors. Um, some of these things I haven't played with, uh, max DNA length uh, is set, the default is 100,000. That's the length that it, it chunks uh, the genome up when it does its analyses. And um, I haven't heard of any, uh, uh, I, I haven't experimented with that yet, uh, uh, but it, if you're having issues with uh, memory, uh, you may want to play with that. Minimum contig equals one. Uh, that's a very low value. So that says, uh, let's say you have an all path assembly or some kind of assembly, and you have a bazillion contigs that are like less than 200 base pairs. And uh, you don't, it's unlikely that they contain genes. You really don't want to waste uh, compute resources on analyzing those. You can set min contig to some number. And uh, I've heard it suggested actually to set that to 10,000. Um, but I, I would be more conservative. Right now, it's set to one. That's extremely conservative. That's if you wanted to analyze everything, even a contig that's one base pair. Not that you would have one. And then there's uh, uh, some uh, other options here. And I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to go uh, through these. But, uh, but you're free to uh, learn more about that on your own. OK, so all of our ducks are in a row now. We have our three uh, maker uh, configuration files. And, and they're all set up. And so to run maker, all we would have to do is type maker and go. If we do that, though, it's going to generate a lot of, it's going to automate, it's going to spew out a lot of data that's going to read, 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 read. And what that is is standard error. And th that is reporting on the progress of what it's doing. You know, it's aligning, it's calculating things. Uh, and it also is reporting warnings and actual error messages. And so it's a good idea to capture that information. And so one way to do that, since we're in the bash shell, is you could type two dot and then type log file. 
and then and that will the ampersand that will run it in the background. So we could we could hit return here, and that will start Maker. Um, another nice thing, though, that I like to do is use this command called time. And what that will do is it'll report on some statistics on how long it took Maker to run. And so let's see if I'm actually typing this properly. What step? Okay. Yeah, so this, this should work. Okay, so this is how I have this set up. Uh, and if you hit return, that should start, start it going. And uh, hit, hit, uh oh. All right, let's try, let's just, let's try it without time. Okay, that seems to be working. Oh, command not fine. I'm not sure why that is. All right, I'm going to try to do the complete path. Out. Okay, so what I ended up typing here was the complete path. For some reason, oh, you know, oh, the reason for this is because I opened a new terminal window and the environment wasn't set up on that. So uh, what's written here should, should have worked for you. If not, uh, then uh, you can enter the complete path. So now uh, Maker's running. You can use the top top command to see what's going on. Okay, uh, right now it's doing, uh, it looks like it's doing uh, repeat mask, blast n. Okay, okay, so um, why don't we go through then results. So this will take about 30 minutes to run. If we, we can examine what the results look like, uh, if we CD to uh, desktop, Maker, example output, okay. Okay, so if you go to uh, slash home, uh, username, desktop, maker p, example data, example output, a, a Maker will create a, a new directory called test underscore genome dot maker dot output. And if you go there and type list, you'll see what Maker has output. Uh, there's a number of, of uh, log files. Uh, probably the, the most important thing to look at is this file called uh, that ends in uh, index log. So that is a log of, of its its progress on completing things. So that's test underscore genome underscore master data store index.log. And this shows a record of the analysis it did. It shows that it started each of these chromosomes and finished. So that's a good sign. Uh, in the handout, I've, I've shown uh, various uh, other values instead of started and finished uh, that would indicate that something went uh, wrong. And then we can look at the contents of the actual output. So if you go into test genome data store, you'll see that there's a, a nested directory structure. So if you do that,
this is a, a typical output. So here, let's look at chromosome 3. So it's given a, a GFF output, and we can actually uh, look at the contents of that. And it's also created uh, a number of FASTA files. And the two uh, most important FASTA files are, um, are chromosome 3 maker proteins FASTA. So that's the protein sequences of the maker uh, predicted genes. And also, uh, there's an analogous file for transcripts. And so these are the FASTA files for what Maker has finally uh, deemed as being uh, real genes. There are some other files here, uh, sort of like a, a reject pile. So here, the Maker non-overlapping ab initio. These are uh, some of the ab initio uh, predictions that did not overlap with a Maker called gene. And Maker deemed them as being uh, ha having low support. Uh, so you don't lose these. You have them. Um, if you think that Maker is underpredicting, uh, and maybe there are some real genes there, you can you can go to that file. Um, and then also the actual, I believe the ones that say snap masked. I think these are are the complete set of ab initio predictions. Uh, so you can use those as well. Now, the uh, rest of the tutorial covers uh, how you would uh, copy these data back to your data store. So once again, after you've done this analysis and you terminate your instance, the data is gone. Uh, so if you want to keep it, um, there you can use uh, something called I commands. Uh, to basically place, uh, it uses IRODs, uh, which is a, 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 a high throughput method for data transfer. Uh, and there are directions in your tutorial on how to do that. And there's also other uh, online directions on the iPlant wiki. A, another um, objective of this tutorial was to use the uh, genome viewer. And I'll see if I can just quickly introduce that. I have this sort of. So there's a number of genome viewers here. And this is preloaded with the integrated genome viewer. And this will open up basically a genome browser and it, it's preloaded right now with the human genome. Once it loads, though, you can actually Im import uh, your genome file and your genome annotations uh, into the viewer. And in your tutorial, um, I've, I've shown some example pictures of that. So the, the final thing I wanted to demonstrate here was the use of some of the um, maker auxiliary scripts. And because the output data is, is, is really distributed in, in this uh, uh, hierarchical uh, directory structure, uh, they have a nice uh, script that's useful for consolidating these, uh, the, the output. And there's probably just enough time to show you that. OK. So if you navigate to this directory where your output lives and you type list, if you can see this file, the test underscore genome master data store underscore index dot log file, that's where you have to be in order to run the script. There are two scripts. One will consolidate your FASTA files. The other will consolidate your GFF files into a single file. And so I'll just try to demonstrate that. And uh, if you do opt maker bin FASTA merge. OK, so FASTA merge. And if you just hit return, it'll give you the usage. So what 
what you have to do is type dash d and then the name of that log file. Hit return. And now what it's done is it's created these new files and they have the same uh, categories. So there was, you know, th there were uh, something like six different FASTA files, the actual maker annotations and the rejected set uh, and the ab initio set. And it's maintained those uh, categories, but it's merged all of the data from the 12 chromosomes into those. And then the, the GF the GFF merge script works in a very similar way. I believe the command is GFF, GFF3 underscore merge. And now it'll create a file called testgenome.all.gff, and you can look at it, and this is what it looks like. So the, the GFF, what's great about the GFF file is that um, it includes not only the gene predictions, but it also includes all of the underlying data. So for example, here it shows uh, where the repeat regions are. So it has the repeat masker data. It shows where the, your BLAST X alignment data is. Um, uh, so, all, so not only, and, and it also shows the annotation from the ab initio gene predictor. So all of the evidence plus the predicted uh, final annotations are there in the GFF file. And this is really important if you want to uh, be able to look at all of these data as a whole to, and again, it goes back to having not only your annotations, but also a record that tracks how you got to that annotation. So why is there an exon here? Oh, it's because this EST is aligned there. Why isn't there a gene here? Oh, it's because there's a repetitive element that's, that's masking that region. So, um, so this information uh, can be used uh, fairly directly if you ever wanted to visualize the data in a genome browser or in Apollo, uh, for example. So. You could do, you could do and it. And could you repeat the question, Josh? Yeah. So why why use uh, FASTA merge or why use GFF merge? You could just do it that way. You could do cat test genome underscore data store star 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 dot GFF, and that'll do the same thing. You could you could redirect that to a file. And it should be the same. Yeah. Another quick question is, are there tools within uh, Maker or iPlant that allow users to see if SNPs within a gene model are synonymous or non-synonymous? Uh, not within Maker, but the discovery environment has a tool. Um, it's called something like EFF3, something like that. But it, uh, uh, and I'm, I, I'm not really familiar with it. I haven't used it. but. Um, It'll do uh, variant effect prediction of, of SNPs. Uh, another useful tool is uh, there's an online uh, uh, web, web service uh, uh, associated with ensemble genomes and also through Grameen. You can load a VCF uh, file and that'll call SNP, uh, variant effect predictions. And the last question uh, that we have time for, uh, if I were to improve the existing genome annotation using just RNA-seq data, will MakerP be able to do it, or do I need to have all the files and not just RNA-seq data? No, so that's actually one of the points uh, that, uh, that the Yandel group has been making recently uh, in presentations that you can take existing annotations. Let's say you have some established annotation from, you know, that's available from, that's been publicly released, and you want to use that as a basis to improve annotation, you can use that, that input and add your RNA-seq to it and have the potential to, to build improved models. And they've done some 
um, proof of concept uh, uh, using Arabidopsis to show that. Okay, so in, in summary, um, um, I think, you know, Maker is a great resource. It's, the, it's really the only uh, software I, I know of that, that is able to put together all of these pieces in a really user-friendly way. I mean, maybe you may argue that doing the command line is not that user-friendly, but the fact that it's able to incorporate all of these tools and it has all of these uh, auxiliary scripts that, that help you, you know, transition from data upstream and data downstream. Um, and it's an actively worked on project. Uh, and I think it'll see a lot of improvements. They have a, a very active uh, uh, developer user group that uh, if you start using this tool, I recommend you join their, the uh, dev user group. Uh, you'll get... Uh, uh, email, uh, you, you can post questions and you'll hear other people's questions and uh, they are very good at uh, responding to, to problems and uh, they are constantly uh, Im improving uh, this software. So I think it's a, a really uh, good way to go uh, for the, um, for the, in the near term to use this tool. Okay. okay, so thanks, Josh, uh, for annotation.